1949, the Red Army brought the Mandate of Heaven back to Earth. The heavenly mandate, wielded by the old dynasties of Peking. The Forbidden City, seat of their power and their decay. Amidst whispering courtiers, plots of poison, enfeebled rulers, China lay open to foreign troops, opium merchants, missionaries. Then, revolution. Since 1949, a new broom swept China clean and swept out most foreigners. Good morning, I'm Warren Shear, and this is the Voice of America Breakfast Show. Here are the hour's main news headlines. The United States says it soon will sign a trade agreement with China. Among other things, the agreement... Rui Ali, 82, a legend, known to millions within China. He arrived 20 years before the revolution, and 30 years after, he lives in China still. A witness to the transformation of the Chinese spirit, and he's won a place within it. Ai Lao, they call him, a popular term of veneration. Old Ali still at work, performing the functions of honor for China's newer visitors. Yes, please it's a pleasure to be able to do so, right. Mr. Ali. Mm. I bring greetings to you from Arthur Jackson Thomas. Very nice. And his friend, his wife, Lovely. Steve. Very happy. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> But away from the tourist circuit, Ali has a more intimate contact with Chinese life. Industrial skills, a central interest of Ali since 1938, when he led a scheme to found thousands of Chinese industrial cooperatives. Very good. Very good. It's a good machine. Ali once taught industrial skills to Chinese peasants. He founded this school 35 years ago. Its headmaster today is his adopted son, Alan. <coughs> Alan's welcome to his father today is memorable. In 1966, during the anti-foreign moods of the Cultural Revolution, Rui Ali was stripped of any association with this school. Today, a formal reinstatement by Thank Communist you. Party speakers below a banner which welcomes advice and instruction from Headmaster Ali. That honorary title has been restored. Comrade Rui Ali is a most sincere friend of the Chinese people. For more than 50 years, whether we were in difficulties in our pioneering days or after the victory of our country, he has been constantly with us in suffering and in happiness. He sympathizes with and supports our just struggle. He has done a great deal of work and made valuable contributions to the Chinese people. Comrade Rui Ali is our old principal and he is also the founder of our school. Since the establishment of Bailey Industrial School in 1942, we have produced and provided the country with large batches of petroleum technical personnel who have now become an important technological force and who have made tremendous contributions to our petroleum industry. We have also been able to lay down a good foundation for the consolidation, expansion and uplifting of the level of teaching. All these are inseparable from the hard work, concern and support of our old principal, Comrade Rui Ali. We will never ever forget this.
，同志们、老同学、新同学，呃，今天到这儿来见面了，我非常高兴。呃，好几年没有来，呃，看你们在这儿都想过去的事儿，很高兴。我讲话讲的不大好，可能口音不好，可能你不大懂，可是慢慢的的，慢慢的的的的。哎，你说太客气，太客气,太客气了。那个那个时候啊，我比较忙，忙比较大，什么没有。好嘞。就是那个那时候那个秘书同志了，他就给我办了。啊！结果他没我办，我很想你，还老记得你打我屁股，经常经常打屁股。Ali's affinity with the Chinese goes deeper than the smile. The Chinese have a background of struggle and pain. So does Ali. Born in New Zealand, named Rui after a Maori chief of legendary courage, and Ali too was a war hero at the age of 20, badly wounded in 1918. He fought back to health. In New Zealand, Ali took up a returned soldier's loan. In 1920, bought half share of a poor backcountry sheep farm. Shearing gangs, a rough camaraderie. But the price of wool slumped, mortgage debts increased, and after six years of struggle, hope faded. Yep. Ali left the farm with nothing. It were mixed emotions. On one hand, you liked Maui Aotearoa, on the other hand, you found it, you felt it was an impossible situation, you had to get out of it. And uh, a beautiful piece of country, a piece of country that in China would uh, f feed a great many people, but uh, all the settlers finally walked off and it was left to go back to Bracken and second growth. Maui Aotearoa, Razorback Land, Hardship the last lesson before the chaos of China. After six years, my partner wanted to get married, and uh, I said, well, the best thing for me is to go off. I had been reading about China in the Auckland Weekly News, about the only literature we got at that time, and, uh, and uh, said, well, I'll go and have a look at that revolution in China and see what it's doing. <laughs> Revolution. The Chinese now run their own society, Shanghai firemen in training. But the old Shanghai was run by colonial powers. In 1927, Ali took work there as a fire officer. Today, he revisits with Communist Party hosts. An irony of history, but in 1927, Communists were rounded up in Shanghai streets and shot. The beginning of a long struggle for power between Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang and the communists. Well, here we are again, after 51 years since I left this room, having spent my first year here uh, learning about China. And uh, I come into this room and look around it, well, as you could recognize it, certainly. There's the stove we used to sit beside and have afternoon tea. Uh, the bathroom is closed off, I expect, for a general bathroom somewhere else. And here are now living uh, 12 firemen in the place that one European sub-officer lived in. After my first few months here, I spent a great deal of my time out on inspection of uh, fire hazards, uh, which eventually led me to becoming inspection officer for the fire department. But it was a, quite a hazardous job, a hazardous in an unusual way, because I remember just up the road from here in Wusang Road, there was a uh, Japanese uh, restaurant owner who had built over a, a alleyway between uh, to lots of houses and had made it into a nice Japanese garden and uh, entertained his friends at this Tsukiyaki restaurant. And so uh, I went in there to uh, have a look at it and, and then he ushered me into the back garden and there was a beautiful young girl, about 18, having a bath without anything on, dashing the water over her. And then he ushered me into a room next door uh, which uh, he said, have a cup of tea before you go back. You must be very hot and tired, beer or something. And uh, then this girl came in uh, with a kimono on and nothing much under it, uh, if anything. 
and uh, she uh, was very charming and wanted me to stay. I thought I'd better go at that point, otherwise it would be very difficult to remove that uh, instruction. And then uh, another place I remember going to, uh, there was a Russian lady, she had a boarding house, they wanted a license for it, and she'd filled up all the exits with bathrooms or something, and a white Russian lady, and uh, uh, then uh, I demurred at these bathrooms and she uh, went into, she said, wait a minute, went into her bedroom and came out without anything on except a wrap over her shoulders and, uh, and she said, uh, come in, darling. And I said, oh, I'd better go. <laughs> so that was that. Those were some hazards that a fire inspection officer had to face. The old fire station today functions under a Chinese municipality. In 1927, it was another part of European control, financed by big insurance houses. Fire. Fatalities. Ali was shocked at the human waste. After 32, uh, I was appointed chief factory inspector, and uh, we operated to uh, uh, try and cut out some of the major abuses. There had been many very bad things happen. The uh, Tsonghua rubber factory with 450 women killed and a whole lot of other things of that kind. And we were out to try to stop those things in the future. One half of Shanghai didn't know what the other half lived like. They had no idea, no conception. The foreigners would live in the French concession or out in the western part of Shanghai. But absolutely no conception of what was happening in the slums of Shanghai the other end. Shanghai, the crossroads of the Orient, run by foreign interests in league with powerful Chinese secret societies. Even Chiang Kai-shek, China's new military strongman, dared not disturb it. An island of light at the edge of a dark continent. Gay, rich, affluent. But Ali saw another side. You see, Shanghai was an octopus city. All the back country was reduced to famine, and uh, refugees came in by the million. And they were easily bought and easily sold to factories. Factories could buy a child worker for a few dollars and then work him to death and throw his body into the river or out to the dogs on a heap at night. And they would look quite fat. They would be swell up with berry berry because the rice would be, wouldn't have any vitamin B in it. They would be overworked and uh, long hours and poor sleeping conditions, bugs eating them at night, sleeping on the lofts above the machines. And uh, naturally they would uh, get berry berry, the hearts would swell and the bodies would swell and then they would die. One particular factory used to get its children mostly from Ningpu. They would come off the boat from Ningpu uh, to the Shanghai Wharf and be taken to that factory, and they would never see any other part of Shanghai. They would never be allowed out. They wouldn't know anything about the Bund or the, or the rest of Shanghai at all. And this child uh, was in advanced stage at Beriberi, and uh, I thought I would take him down and they could try out their medicines on him and see how far they would get with it. Uh, and he... Uh, he held on to my hand, very grimly, tiny little hand, as we went down. Uh, it was a big experience to go in a car and be taken down into the middle of a big city he'd never seen and go to a hospital, his upper lift, he'd never heard of such things, and then to go on. And uh, before I left him, he uh, pulled out of his pocket two little bulbs that he'd managed to one green and one red and he thought these were very, very pretty, and he thought the be only thing he had, and he would give them to me, uh, that meant a great deal to him, and of course they meant a great deal to me too. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the waste of human life like that, of good life, the best, uh, the best life in China uh, was fantastic in those days. Europeans in the clubs, there was no tomorrow. But a small group within the international settlement knew the suffering of Shanghai's workers. They read the theories of Marx, met with and sometimes sheltered communist fugitives, and spoke in secret of a new future. 
Ali was one of this group. Also, YWCA organizers Talitha Gerlach and Cora Tang. You remember, Cora, we arranged for groups of students to visit factories. Yeah. What did we see? Here were huge cauldrons of boiling water with silk cocoons floating on top. And who managed the silk cocoons? Yes. What Children, was it? nine or eight Children. or ten years old. Eight or nine or ten-year-old girls. Children. Uh. And what did they have to do? Mm -hmm. They had to see that the cocoons got sufficiently wet so that the wax would melt uh, around the end out, of the silk, the, thread. the silk thread. Mm -hmm. The silk thread. And who were these little girls? Their fingers, their hands were red swollen. and swollen. And what did they wear? <coughs> Just one little thin shirt. The continual uh, incredible exploitation of children uh, thrown up against this vast city, the city of great wealth, enormous fortunes being made, one millionaire after another coming out of Shanghai, going back to spend his gains abroad. Mm -hmm. From out of this city, uh, where such a great portion of the population lived in utter destitution and want. And uh, this uh, was a very, impressed me very, very deeply, and more so as we went around. I took one fellow from uh, Europe around, an uh, uh, eminent writer, and he said, I, after I'd shown him around all the morning, he said, I don't know how the hell you can stand looking at this all day. Uh, so gradually we began to realize that something would have to be done. If you're normal people, what would you do in this situation? Go on seeing it? Or what are you going to just do? So that was really was why people grouped around. You know, before I came to China, here to Shanghai, I knew nothing about Karl Marx or Marxism. It was the experience here in Shanghai of gradually being introduced to some of the writings of Karl Marx that opened my eyes to a, a, a solution, a positive solution, that today we would call it a revolutionary solution. Really, I remember <coughs> I was very much impressed by your coming back from Mongolia and told us how people have suffered in, in the outskirts of the country. And when you came back, <coughs> you made a report to us about how those boys lived and how they struggled. And you especially mentioned the fact that nothing can do but a revolution. That talk was really very moving. Communist uprisings in the cities failed. But by 1929, communist fighters moved into country areas. Mao's idea, where hardship was extreme, the peasants would listen. In the summertime of 1929, I went up to Inner Mongolia to help to help the China International Famine Relief Commission, who were digging a big uh, canal with refugee labor uh, across the uh, grasslands there. They were taking water from the Yellow River and uh, uh, leading it out onto uh, uh, unirrigated land, trying to bring it back. The people who died in the Northwest in those years were probably eight million. But it didn't even make the newspapers of the world. <laughs> In uh, Salachi, uh, in the moat, I think in that one summer, a hundred thousand odd people were buried. Jai Beng Kui, now 72 worked on the canal as a 20-year-old near Tumi Chuan. <laughs> the 
the workers had a song. Tumi Chuan is a place for the rich. We poor have no land. Despots and tyrants are everywhere, and our eyes shed constant tears. Our boys cry sadly, and our girls are sold to hell. Back to Shanghai, Ali joined the communist underground. Then Japanese ambitions became clear to conquer China, and communist activists helped direct the new mood of Chinese patriotism. I think back uh, when I wrote an article under a pen name for a Shanghai magazine, The Voice of China, about a gang working on a construction job on a Shanghai street. And at that time, everything had to be done by hand. There were no mechanical drivers. And a foreman would lead. Some 20 or 30 workers would pull on ropes. And uh, he would take a chant from something he saw on the street. And the workers would answer back. Uh, he would say, here's a fat lady uh, coming along, covered with furs and jewels. And, uh, and then the workers would say, uh, ay ya hey And then the, the, the stone would drop with a great bump onto the top of the pile, as though it was dropping on top of the woman they were right talking about. Then uh, he would say, uh, here come the Japanese tanks all together. Down the road, they look like a lot of tortoises. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll all be gone one day and we'll still be here. And then the workers would say, ay, ah, uh, hey, and down would come the, the, the stone again. And then uh, uh, along would come a foreign businessman uh, sitting very proudly at the back of a car. And they would say, here comes a foreigner. You can see his blue eyes and big nose and he no, got no hair. What woman would like to sleep with him? And down would come the, the stone. Ay, ya, hey, and that is that. Now here on this Shanghai steel mill, we have uh, Japanese technicians working along with uh, Chinese workers, and uh, it was right here that there was a Japanese World War II aerodrome. Japan poured half a million troops into China, a lightning wind before it turned to face America in the Pacific full strength. But red guerrillas fought back and the popular mood forced Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang to do the same. But supplies were short. Japan took China's heavy industry and blockaded the interior. Ali helped meet an urgent war need to keep production going inside the Japanese blockade. This was Gong Hao. Gung-ho, work together. Ali's name for a plan to revitalize Chinese industry. It became an international slogan. Japan had knocked out 80% of China's industry. With loans totaling millions of Chinese dollars, Gung-ho aimed to build it up again. It worked. Factories like this traced their beginnings to Gung-ho. The plan was communistic spread China's production away from the Japanese through the vast hinterland in small cooperatives. The people responded. Amongst its benefits, jobs for refugees fleeing inland from the Japanese advance. When we started Gung Ho in, in this town, the first thing was to set up a machine shop so that we could make small machines for the other cooperatives, for the printing cooperative and for all the other cooperatives. And this was the big idea, and it was a bit of a job because there, was no, there were no other machine shops in the vicinity, and uh, we had to bring the machines from a long way off, and uh, we had to bring in workers, and we had no materials, and the, and the Guomindang were trying to stop us doing anything at all, although the Japanese war was on. Ah. And uh, uh, Comrade Liu here, he was one of, the, one of the original workers. Okay. Uh, so, in 1938, the Communist Party 
in 1938, during the War of Resistance, the Japanese devils drove away our people. All of us unemployed machine workers were organized into machine cooperatives with the assistance of the South Central Headquarters of Gong Ho, and in particular, Comrade Ali himself. We embarked on production for self-survival. It was extremely difficult at that time. We had no pay, no capital, and no facilities. Under the leadership and assistance of Comrade Ali, we thought of some methods which were largely repairing and gathering together bits and pieces from various machines to produce things such as printing machines. During the initial period, we had neither tools nor raw materials. We had some broken machines which we reassembled to use again. When we had work to do, we drew our pay. Without work, we got no pay. The Gumandang during that time showed no concern for us. Only the Gongho office provided us with organization and leadership involving us in production for self-survival. Thus, unemployed workers like us were able to obtain jobs and wages and survive. <laughs> Chinese patriotism had awaited the right signal. The idea of cooperatives tapped the popular mood. So I thought, well, that a good idea would be just gung ho. It's very simple. It's uh, work together, and that's what we're trying to raise a movement to do. And uh, there is no other way to do this movement uh, than by uh, getting the people of China to do it themselves, to build on the group consciousness of people uh, to carry that out. We had no way to provide a huge organization to marshal people in, uh, to make them do something that won't work. These things must be done by the people themselves, and they must be encouraged to set up those uh, little industries to do them. Thousands of cooperative industries sprang up all over China. This entailed a fantastic amount of travel through all kinds of country by all kinds of conveyances, and uh, it uh, was rather exhausting, uh, naturally. But uh, one very, very, very impressive thing was how easily the thing went. Uh, you could uh, go out to a marketplace in, in Jiangxi, for instance, and talk in the marketplace that here is money of people who wanted to organize some kind of little industry and people would come and organize and take that money and they would pay it all back. We never had any problem in paying back loans in those times. The people were keen on it. It struck a popular chord. The only thing is that it went rather too fast for the Guomindang to catch up with. Uh, in one place in Yunnan, a group of uh, landlords met in the Chamber of Commerce and they said, uh, Buddha Leo, Buddha Leo, terrible, terrible, the communists have come. Here are factories setting up without managers of their own, without owners. The uh, high point came in the years uh, 40 and 41, really, and when the task of holding the Guomindang in the war uh, was most important. Kung Xiangxi, the prime minister at one stage, said, what are you people trying to make us fight? Uh, and we, we don't even have blankets enough for the uh, generalissimo soldiers. So I said, well, let's make the blankets. And we made the first million in the, in the next period. Uh, another place over by the new fourth army, we set up a machine cooperative there, and they were able to make 40,000 hand grenades uh, we went on in various uh, localities doing what we could. Nevertheless, uh, the Guomindang special agencies began to pay more attention to Gung Ho and said, this is a lot of red hats and uh, we must stop this movement from going ahead as it is as planned. And so they entered a period of suppression uh, where many of the good uh, workers were knocked out or ran, had to driven away or killed or imprisoned. Uh, all over the country. We had that happening. But nevertheless, 
we did keep on. And, uh, but more and more, it seemed to me that in order to get the kind of leadership we needed uh, for the cooperatives, we would have to train peasant boys from the ranks of the peasants for the kind of leadership to really uh, take the people ahead. China's northwest, Gobi Desert, and the ancient guardian of desert boundaries, the end of the Great Wall, a Jiayuguan, a sparse region where Ali sought shelter from China's turmoil. A suspicious Chiang Kai-shek had dismissed him from Gung Ho. Still, Gung Ho's overseas donor sent some money direct to Ali, and Ali turned to the working people. At Sandam, a half-deserted trading town, he began anew. Gung Ho's past function included small schools. Now, in disused temples, Ali and a fellow worker, George Hogg, built up another school, more boldly experimental. Then, in 1945, Hogg died of tetanus. This death of an English Gung Ho worker became to Ali a symbol of international communism. But Hogg's grave became, too, a barometer of China's changing moods. By the late 1960s, an anti-foreign mood prevailed. The grave was obliterated. But today, another political shift, and for Ali's return, it has been rebuilt. When we went to Sandan, uh, just after George died, really, we cut into a big stone there four characters, Chong Zhao Feng Fen Shi, which means create and analyze, because we wanted those kids there to grow up uh, able to create, able to analyze, especially all the things that they heard around them in the, that time of Guomindang. Uh, controlled society. We couldn't uh, talk politics in those days, but we could carry out uh, a political message through production. We wanted the kids to be able to struggle. We wanted them to be better than the loafers who got into politics, who controlled China under the Kuomintang. So struggle and cooperation were the basics in the teaching of those days. You had to arm those kids so they were able to do things. If you didn't arm them with technique, then they wouldn't be able to do anything. They could only talk, and talk gets you nowhere. From a roll of 60, the Sandan School grew to 600. Students, workers and teachers, both Chinese and foreign. Educate the peasant children, a radical step in 1940s China. Ali believed he could awaken a vast productive capacity. He believed in the ability of the peasants to learn basic industrial skills. Sandan had machine shops, an electricity plant, a farm, textile weaving, its own mines, trucks, a smelter, a hospital, glass and paper making works, pottery kilns. In all, 14 sections down to the smallest, button making from animal bone. Ali believed that students learn best working outdoors beside their teacher, producing real goods keeping classroom discipline to a minimum. Well, I can remember in my early childhood, uh, we had a teacher who, uh, a primary school teacher who lived on the strap. I think I was strapped every day in school as a child. And uh, one day, five times, so that the, around the nails, the fingers bled a bit. And, uh, and that, she believed in the strap, and she strapped it in. And I felt that that wasn't quite the way, because you just don't get the results that way. You get results when people believe in the teachers, like the teachers, and work together with them, and the teachers learning at the same time as the kid. One learned all the time at Sandan, uh, making more mistakes than most people make, probably, but still learning and still able to, uh, to get the kids to do things. 
For five years, Sandan stood alone, but its isolation ended as remnants of Guomindang armies fled before the communists. Uh, as the situation grew more chaotic, various forces tried to uh, eliminate uh, Sandan. This uh, culminated in one of the worst uh, groups to come was a group of a thousand militia who were sent to eliminate the whole school. And uh, that was quite a threat. They came around uh, inspecting the whole place and uh, we inspected their situation too. At the back of the school they had two machine guns trained on us and my house at the back and we surveyed it and thought it wouldn't be too difficult to knock them out if it was, if it was necessary. Then uh, as the PLA uh, came breaking through uh, the uh, mountains, the Chilean mountains to our south and cutting the road going west, uh, this whole group together with the Guomantang administration of the county uh, all vanished into the North Mountains at night and uh, next morning we were left uh, waiting liberation. September 1949, liberation, people's courts. The school's trucks, broken into bits to avoid loss to retreating Gumindang soldiers, were reassembled and driven by teachers and students west to liberate the human oil field. Sandan's isolation was over. Change was inevitable. Uh, in the years immediately following liberation, uh, we kept on, and I would have liked to have carried on uh, for the rest of my time doing that kind of thing because I felt it was so important. And I still feel it's important to give an all-around education uh, to people in that way. But the, the importance of specialized technical education was so immensely uh, important at that time that uh, all these organizations needed people who could do things and do one thing. So the school had to <coughs> leave its original idea and come down to Lanjo and train people for definite things because that was the immediate demand. The Lanjo school now trains oil workers and Ali's life changed too. The 1950s, international peace meetings, a demand from Nero to build cooperatives in India, the first of over 30 books, an invitation from Che Guevara, and in the 1960s, a visit to Cuba. The 70s and 80s, more writing, articles, poetry on China and working people. People don't realize that the, the amount of water that can come down that yeah. area, mm. and you come down on top of this place here, mm. it won't be so good. Mm. A special day for the school's headmaster, Alan, one of Ali's two adopted sons. For both sons were victims of the Cultural Revolution, and for an alleged misdemeanor, Alan was beaten, lost his job. The school was closed, its tradition disparaged. Long years when Alan could not visit Rui Ali. To have a foreign father, Alan's fate through good times and bad. <laughs> spend my uh, boyhood in Shanghai. Uh, we usually go out for the uh, walk in the country during the weekend. And also we saw uh, some of our, uh, our foreign friends. Now in the outskirts of Shanghai, uh, where there's a lot of young kids running um, behind us, calling out high nose, high nose, or I call it uh, foreign devil, foreign devil, see? Young guys, young guys. Well, I thought such a man like Mr. Ali is very friendly to Chinese people. Why should he call him young guys, foreign devil, foreign devil? Uh, uh, then I made the impression angry, you see? Uh, Mr. Ali saw my impression. He said, now you should not be angry because China, Chinese people has been uh, oppressed by the foreigners for the last hundred years. Ever since the Opium War, you know, 1840. Eh? So they, they don't know which foreigner is good, which foreigner is bad. Anyway, the foreigners give the impression as imperialism, who are trying to uh, uh, press the Chinese people, look down the Chinese people. So he called me high nose, all right, let me call it. If he wants to like, call me uh, young devils, all right, let him call it. You should not get angry. They are quite all right. That's what he told me. <laughs>
<laughs> now, my father gave me strong uh, impression is I think that he is a man keeps. Eh? He keeps everything to any to the people he loves. See? For instance, in, in our school, Bailey Santa Bailey School, whenever he sees a student, uh, he says he need a pair of shoes, he find a pair of shoes. Socks, stockings, he find a pair of stockings. So after all, he himself has nothing left. I, he had uh, possessed a lot of things, but all gave away. Uh, to friends, to the uh, young students, and to people, Chinese people. Uh, so, very, very strong impression in my head. I can never forget. He said, man, gives not once. He always think of the poor people. That's why he became a very, very good friend of the Chinese people. He loved the Chinese people uh, as much as he does the New Zealand people, although he's a New Zealander. But Ali's status is shaped by politics too. A foreigner for 10 years to 1976, buffeted by China's radical factions. His house raided by Red Guards, later book editions pulped. Joe and Lai, a personal friend, helped protect him. In 1976, Joe died. But then the tension eased with the arrest of the Gang of Four. At Huangpi Commune, Ali's restored status is given tangible shape. <laughs> Huangpi Commune is famous for social realism sculpture, of struggle, but turns back now to older Chinese myths and to figurines, which supply an expanding tourist market. When we first started at Sandan, uh, two members of the Cooperative Party of England came, and a very nice uh, middle-aged gentleman in, uh, in uh, cutaway coats and a uh, bowler hat. And uh, they went all the way up to Sandan. It was a long way in those times. And they uh, suggested that, uh, would I receive a, a knighthood? And I said, well, uh, uh, I don't think that would be possible. I think it's a rather... A, hopeless idea because I'm trying to work with people and uh, I, that's not kind the kind of thing that I want. It wouldn't help Bung Ho, it wouldn't help anybody. And uh, so they went back. I still feel the same way as the ordinary Chinese does about uh, honors and things like that. Mm, he doesn't think much of them. The Gorgon stare of a Ming Dynasty tomb near Sandan. Kings forgotten in a swirl of Gobi sand, Ali once wrote. Vain statues of a class society, but beneath it, the anonymous power of the people. A history more vast in which to dig and discover. Uh, this little poem is one by a Tang poet called Bai Ju Yi, who lived in the mid-ninth century in the Tang dynasty. Uh, he calls it uh, about myself. He's already old, about a couple of years before he died. He says, red cheeks, gray beard. This is me, half drunk with years. All seems empty. Now I'm old, sick and thin, but still I'm good at poetry, as if crazy with it. I hear that there are people doing a picture of me on a silk screen. These are little bits that always fascinate me as I go through the old um, poets. I myself am a very poor translator and uh, of course have to have the uh, assistance of a good editor before anything goes into print because I make so many mistakes. And my old Chinese is pretty poor because I just simply forget characters as the years go on. And uh, 
thinking of Bardzoui and this uh, particular uh, translation, he has many uh, poems which Western people would be very interested in. He has one about a date tree. He said, you know, the date tree is the poorest looking tree around. It has little narrow leaves. It has no flowers. It has twisted branches. And it's, uh, it's a poor looking thing. But if you want to get the axle for a cart, you go to the date tree and cut the trunk down for that. Chinese peasants, those who bore the past burden. Mao knew their strength and spoke of their destiny. In the original ideas of the Russian Communist Party, they tried to bring to China right away back in 1925-26. The peasant masses were useless. They were rea reactionary and they, they could only be used to push up the working class in the cities to a position of dominance. And that idea Chairman Mao squashed pretty effectively. He used the common people of the countryside to uh, carry out the revolution. And it will be the masses of the common people of countryside which will keep the Chinese revolution pure. <laughs> Put down the story of your life, a friend once asked Ali. Another story, replied Ali, from another atom. Yet maybe all these stories fit into a pattern somewhere. Ali made his life amidst the common people of China. The currents of their struggle gave his own life its direction. I don't have any of the good works complex. I'm not a missionary. Uh, I've always tried to integrate myself with people just in a normal, simple way and work along with them. And in my writing, I just patter along now. I'm no longer young and I can just go along and write down the things that I see that I think might interest some people, not everybody, but some people that they might pick up and gain something from. Myself, I have always been a learner and I will continue being a learner all the way through. Uh, just an ordinary person, an ordinary uh, New Zealand country bumpkin, more or less, and uh, there we are. A working man, a man of struggle. In a recent poem he wrote, the sky, glowing with the red of setting sun, heralds another bright dawn. A quarter of the world is China. In that strength, my mind finds peace again. <laughs> 